Welcome to the Damcasters. I'm your host, Matt Bone. I'm sure for all of us, there is one book that lives on the bedside table. For me, that is Joseph Heller's Catch-22. It's a novel that I can return to and find new things every time, which is an experience for many others as well. I have multiple copies of it, the battered paperback upstairs, the Folio Society edition that's in the front room. Catch-22 is one of the great American novels, and Heller is one of the great American novelists. But the experiences that he faced flying with the 57th bomb wing from Corsica through the flak heavy skies of Italy shaped the absurdities and the horrors that he captures in his book. Historian and screenwriter Tom McKelvey Cleaver, six years ago now, wrote a book called The Bridge Busters, the true story of the Catch-22 bomb wing, where he looks into Joe Heller's time in Corsica and what the 57th got up to. And fascinatingly, why Joe Heller left before his tour was completed. Now, the book's finally getting released here in the UK, so it was great to talk to Tom over the phone in LA. But we have to start where any discussion about a book begins. When was the first time he read Catch-22? I read Catch-22 in the spring of 1963 when I picked it up at a bookstore in San Diego in the Navy on the way, uh, as, as we were leaving for the West, as I was leaving for the Western Pacific. And I read it on the boat over the, over, and it was, it, and I had, at, by that point, I'd been in the Navy about 10 months and the book made perfect sense. <laughs> so e even in the Navy, the, the absurdities that Heller faced were the same. So yeah. there's no, no yeah, Navy no, Air Force the, distinction. Right. The, 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 the whole, the whole thing about what the, what the book is about is the powerlessness of an individual to make moral choice in a large organization. And that is interestingly enough, knowing that about it, when I started realizing when I, during my research that the book wasn't a, uh, the, the, that the book, you know, he, he always said, that, you know, it's pure, you know, it, it's pure fiction. Well, no, it's actually not. Um, you, can, the, you can trace definite events to, de to, to, to sections in the book and it makes perfect sense that it would be that that it would uh, that it would be like that. No, I was just sort of thinking as 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 a Navy man, and you, you're seeing those, those parallels for, and then the, the the research you did later for what what sort of effect did it have on you? Because it it sort of lives on my bedside table as something I dive into quite regularly. Because you know, as you say, the big organizations I work for a big company for the day job, and you see those sort of impossible circular events. I'm just sort of wondering what what it left you thinking about as a, as a Navy man and as a writer now? Oh, um, well, number one, then I, I, I discovered within a matter of hours that I was, that I was probably not going to be a good fit for the Navy. It took me a number of years to finally figure out that I'm not a good fit for any large, or, large bureaucratic organization. So it wasn't the <laughs> Navy's fault. Um, it, it's, it's that I'm Asperger's and I'm creative and I, and, you know, and I like living alone. Huh. <laughs> yeah, I, I had no trouble when everybody was doing co social distancing. I was going like, what is this social distancing you speak of? But, it's, um, it's Tuesday but for the, me. Uh, but, but, the, but the, the, the value of the Navy was, was, a, was number four. I, I graduated 125 from the bottom of a graduating class of 950 from high school with high test scores. In, in, in those days, they didn't know what Asperger's was, but that was that's classic Asperger's right there, mm -hmm. high, high test scores and low grades. But I immediately realized that I wanted to go to college when I got out because strictly on the fact that the officers got treated better than I did and they all seemed to have college degrees. And I ended up going back to school, and th and when I was studying what I wanted to study, I ended up with two co with two advanced degrees. So, so there you are. Um, what I discovered is, if if I'm interested in something, I have virtually total recall, and if I'm not, it goes in one ear and out the other. 
But anyway, though, the Navy taught me enough, to, uh, taught me the other, the other thing that you really need if you're going to live the kind of life I, I live of, yeah. of being about running your own affairs is self-discipline. You know, I, something has to be done at 4 p.m. You plan to do it. So you can get, you see, you, know, you have a, you have a job to do. It's going to take this, 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 and that, and that, and that. Um, that was stuff that, the, that I learned from the, I, I, I frequently say that you couldn't get me in the Navy again for $10 million tax free. And I wouldn't take a hundred million for what I learned. <laughs> it's very funny. Now I'm, you know, now this, I actually made it to third class petty officer, which always surprised me. But in those days it was actually, if you, if you kept your nose clean and you signed your name right on the, on the, on the test, you were likely to get, you were likely to pass in those days. But, um, Nowadays, I you know I have admirals for friends, which is pretty cool. So, so I, signing you fraternizing name... with admirals. <laughs> how, how far you've come, sir? Yeah. So let's and they, let... and they think it's cool to be with me. <laughs> <laughs> so I so you, you're saying that you sort of sign your name to the test and the promotion comes away. So the the, the major major business really isn't that far fetched. Oh no. Yeah, you know, a good example. Our first commanding officer, Captain Cooper, um, who later became commander of Task Force Seventy Seven uh, in, in, in during Operation Linebacker in Seventy Two. Um, I after I'm after I was in the Navy, I, I later found out that he was commonly considered. Uh, there's three of the admirals I know. I told me that once I let them know that I had served under un, under Cooper, that if they hadn't served under him as junior officers, they didn't think they would have made admiral be, for, for what they learned from him. He was commonly considered one of the finest naval officers of his generation. And he was the guy, every, every man on the ship thought that the captain knew him. He would walk through the ship, and, if, and he had a good, a good sense for, for, for names and faces. And if, he, if he'd had any dealings with you before, if he ran across you, he would nod and say good morning. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, and he also was one of those guys who, and I later found out this was very true. It, it seemed this way to me, and I found out when he was, that when he was leading fighter squadrons, it, it was true that he, there was nothing he asked you to do that he hadn't done first. He was one of those guys. And he also, he ruled with the spirit of the law rather than the letter of the law. Right. Um, and he, and... The, and, and, the, and the result was that that ship, under his command, had every award that the Navy could give the, for, for, the crew to, for the crew to win. And, he, and, then he, and then just when I left the ship to go, to, to go on the Admiral's staff, he left the ship to go and, and, and take command of the Ticonderoga for, and, and go to Vietnam. But he, his replacement was a guy... It was a major major. Um, he was that guy who he, he actually he wasn't he he was major major with a good dose of queeg, um, <laughs> and he was strictly by the book and he had no charisma. And in the course of a year, with less than a five percent turnover in the crew, they lost every one of the awards. Wow. I I always say if. Leadership isn't the only thing. It's, it's everything. It is, or it isn't everything. It's the only thing. Um, mm. And I often find myself, when, when, when I'm puzzled by something to do, I often think to myself, what would Captain Cooper do in this situation? And it usually comes up with a solution. But he went on and became a, a full four-star. And um, every one of the, uh, of, the, of the admirals I know who were from that, gen who were that they were junior officers to him. They all say, you know, wow, you knew you knew Captain Cooper. You were in his, you know, they they're impressed. He's that kind of guy, and um, you know, good leaders. Well, is this true in in, in your in a good leadership always shows? Mm -hmm. But the major majors, there's more of them than you think. Mm -hmm. But it, that's all. I think that's true in any large organization. The leadership aspect sort of comes through a lot in Catch Twenty Two and in your book 
especially talking about the the 57th bomb wing which was which was Heller's wing and I guess we need to sort of start talking about about them because they are the subjects of oh, your, yeah, the, the bridge busters let me let me tell you how, how I ended up uh, getting in getting into doing this it was very hmm. it's kind of funny um I had just met Tim Hornfisher who was also in addition to being a, a really really good uh, military historian was also probably the number one nonfiction literary agent in the country and I met him in 2014 after I had after I had published Fable 15 my first book and he was willing to become my agent and so then I had to find something that was worthy of being represented by him and and that 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 um, that Veterans Day um, November 11th I was on the net and I saw an article I had, I can't remember the site, but anyway, a woman talked about the fact that her father had served in World War II and had never spoken of his experiences. And she had found some papers and, and discovered the name of, uh, of, of his organization, about 57th Bomb Wing. And she discovered that they were, that the group was having a reunion in Des Moines, which was about a hundred miles from where they lived. And so she decided she would take her father to the reunion, which would be, it was, it was 2014, 70 years after he'd seen these guys. And she said, and after he's, since he's come back from the reunion, he can't stop talking <laughs> about his experiences in the war. It was the best thing I ever, I could ever have done for him. And Immediately, I thought that this was an interesting person to talk to because nobody had talked to him before. And I was also a, a, a contributing editor to Flight, to Flight Journal, and we were looking for the stories not told. And so I was able to hunt her, hunt her down on the net and find an, and find an email address and emailed her and said I was interested in talking to her father. And I, and I did. And he was very interesting. He'd been, he was a, he'd been a young guy. He, he started out as a co-pilot just when Operation Bingo started. Paul Young, he's the one in the book. You, mm -hmm. you know him by name. Um, and he uh, and he just started out when Operation Bingo started. And he told me all these people he knew. And then he made mention that he said, "You know, we all know the we all know the stories in Catch Twenty Two are real." Wow. And that went, and I went, "Oh, that's interesting." And then. Uh, through him, through through him, I was able. I, I got in touch with the guy who runs the uh, the the website for the 57th Bomb Wing, and Dan has collected practically every piece of paper that was ever generated. But the main thing that he that he has there at the site is he has all of the war diaries. And war diaries, it's an interesting thing. Their 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 quality varies by whoever it was who was doing them. Uh, the, the war diarist for the 321st bomb group, uh, who was uh, he was very he was a he was Nichols Captain Nichols was 35 and a Wall Street lawyer when the war began, and he left Wall Street and became and joined, and became the and became the the group intelligence officer, and um and and the stories about him are that he was the guy that basically became the person that really cared for everybody and made certain people were okay, but he but his his war drive, he has every mission, every plane, every guy who was on which mission on, in, in that plane, and an account of the mission, which is great. Mm -hmm. It's just perfect material. And the guy from the 340th bomb group, which is Hiller's unit, is not that kind of a, a guy. But he did have every mission, every airplane, and who was aboard. And that was the the who was aboard is interesting because they did not have regular crews. You didn't you didn't necessarily fly with the same guys every time. And when they and when they were were stuck with with, with as many missions as they were flying at, at the end of the at the end of the war because they couldn't get any any replacements. Guys were, as Paul put it, we guys were flying. Any he says he says I was the first pilot and I would and I told him I'll, I'll fly co-pilot just to get the mission. To try and, and get out from it, get out from it, but the, but the the interesting thing is you can there there with with Heller, 
you can find him. He's in there. And then there's all the things that Heller said about him. He said that, number one that the book that the, the that the novel was fiction, which it turns out it, it isn't. He also said that he flew mostly milk runs, which is partially true. And he and it's in the record that he that he left in January of forty five with sixty missions, and that's really interesting because at that time the mission total was 70. Nobody was getting out from that. And just after that, they the, the, the mission total, the, the, the tour changed to for the duration of the war because of, because of the replacement situation. And he gets out on 60 missions and he says he flew mostly milk runs. Um, and the interesting thing is that after August, no, after the after the, his last mission that's hair raising is the mission to to uh, to Trieste where they where they blew up the Italian cruiser, and he and he was in the lead plane that, that went after Flak, which was like in and out, but that's the last hot mission he flies, and that's mission forty two, between his arrival and he started flying missions. He, he arrived in late May of forty. He arrived. 10 days, 10 days after Helbig's raid on the, on, on the airfield that, that, that ends up in the, in the book being the, uh, the bomb, the, the bombing mission, the mile of binder binder does as a, as a business deal. But he started flying missions in early, in, in early June. And at that time, a group had four squadrons, two squadrons flew a morning mission, two squadrons flew an afternoon mission. And a guy, and, and a crewman was flying between two and three missions a week, and by the and by and by mid August, Eller's got forty missions. So, so he's it, he's it, not it, hanging it, around, is he? He's he's going up a he's, lot. He's flying missions just mm -hmm. like everybody else, two or three, you know, two or three a week. And then between September and December, he flies twenty missions, half the rate that he was flying before. And the interesting thing is that this is the point where he says milk runs. And, but, but what's happening at that time from September 44 to, to January when he leaves is number one, the mission's flown for Operation Olive, the, the, the final ally that fa failed attempt to break into the Po Valley in, in, in September and October. And they were flying four missions a day and flying against heavy stuff. And he's not on the, he's not on the flight record. And then there's Operation Bingo, and nobody that I talked to who flew Operation Bingo, the, the, the Battle of the Brenner Pass, called any mission they flew a milk run. But he says he flew milk runs. And now, so something happens in August. Well, it did. It's called the bombing of the Satimo Bridge, and it's in the book. The, um, the Satimo Bridge is a bridge... Um, Caesar's legions built it on their way to Gaul in 55 BC. Um, Napoleon ro uh, rode across it on his way to Marengo in 1800. Um, it's a, a road there uh, in the Apennines near the French border. And there's a small town of about 600 people. It's just a farming community. And it happens to be there because the bridge is there. You know, and that's where people come come across the bridge and go to the market and all that sort of stuff. And there was a mission they nobody liked this mission. It was called it was called uh, creating rubble. They would bomb places specifically to knock down buildings to make it troublesome for the enemy to move troops through the area because the road was blocked. And for, and for, and they hated those missions because the B25 they were flying at 7 or 8,000 feet when they made their attack which is low enough that you can see what you're doing. And when they came up to the Satimo Bridge, the lead bombardier immediately realized that the coordinates that were in his Norton bomb trap were going to put the bombs in the town instead of the village because the bridge and the town are like right next to each other. And the, and the coordinates were slightly off. So he immediately starts working on, on it. And he, and he later says in the 50s that he should have just aborted the mission. Because he doesn't get the coordinates, and they end up bombing the town. 
and they kill about 150 people out of 600, which is a pretty heavy, heavy casualty rate. And one, and, and one of the guys leaves the formation and drops his bombs in an open field. He comes back and he says he was dodging flak. Well, when you were on the bomb run, you didn't do you didn't dodge for flak. So, and nobody said anything against him against what he did. Nobody. And if you go in the book, there is a story where they're told that they're that that, that they're going to bomb a village to create rubble because a German Panzer division is coming through. That's exactly what was what the reasoning was for the for the, for the bombing of the Timo Bridge, and nobody wants to go, nobody wants to do it. And Colonel Corn comes in, and he, he and he hears their complaints, and he says, "Well, you know, you guys, we go out of our way to try and get one of these to get these easy missions for you whenever we can, but you know, if you don't want them, I can get you Bologna any time. I can get you Bologna every day." Bologna being a a tough target, mm -hmm. and everybody is quiet. Nobody responds, and he looks at him. He says, "I thought so." And every man in there hates himself because he just he just chose killing people he didn't know over the possibility of being killed himself. It's the heart of the moral choice that's in the book. And because in, in that section, Yossarian speaks up, doesn't he? And he, he's, he shouts it down. And there's the implication there that Heller always felt that he should have spoken up, but never did. So he at right. least makes his yes. character. Do, Heller yeah. thought that he, but, but the interesting thing is that it's the team of Heller did speak up afterwards a little bit. And, and to the point where he and two other bombardiers were placed in hack. But then they were, but, but that only lasted a day, and then they were taken out of hack because they had to fly missions. Um, but after that, it's when he no longer is, show, is showing up in the in the record as as being as being this outspoken guy that he was, and he's no longer flying tough missions. Now he isn't here to, to say, but the, but but in the novel, what happens after that after that scene is that Yossarian gets the offer from the from the commander that he turns down. Yossarian, they say, like us, we can make things easy for you. And he turns them down. Mm -hmm. What happened is that Heller said yes to what Yossarian said no to. And the interesting thing is, and, 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 and while I'm doing the research, I met this guy who's the son of, of one of the other bombardiers who, who was a filmmaker, and this guy made documentaries for Colonel Chapman, who was the, who was the group commander. Chapman used the documentaries to you know, butter himself up with, with higher command because he wanted to become a general. And at this point, he starts to get, he, he gets an assignment to make, a, to make a movie called Training in Combat. And what it is, is it's a story about how replacement air crew are brought in and given training before they go to fly their operational missions with the group. And he gets a bunch of people who are assigned to be his actors. And because it's going to take several months to make the movie, these guys, he can't, once he puts them on film, he can't replace them if they get shot down. But he can't have them completely taken off operations because that's bad for morale for everybody else that they are. And so all of a sudden, these guys, get easy missions so that they can make the movie. And Heller is one of them. He plays Pete, a replacement bombardier. Heller said many times that people would ask him about photographs of him when he was in the service. He said, nobody ever took a picture of me. Well, I got like about 20 of them that, <laughs> that, that were taken of him when he's, when he's making the movie. And so what happened? This Heller said yes to something that he that he he morally felt that he was bad for having done. And the interesting thing is, once I came up with this hypothesis, I I asked the other guys in the group that that I was 
who I was dealing with, I, I said, what do you think? Does this sound like it? And they all said, yeah, that could have happened. And they all, and every last one of them said, I'd have taken the deal too. They knew that everybody had to break it, but one of them taught, told me that, that when he came back from his 50th mission, which was tough, he couldn't get out of the airplane. He fell out of it, and he couldn't get up from, 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 from his fall. And they ended up put, taking him in the hospital for a month before he could come back to the group, and it was purely psychological. They, all, the little, all of the people who'd been flying combat, they all understood. But Heller, I mean, you had, you had this thing in, when he's coming to when he's coming to 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 the group, he ends up. I I've got it here. Uh, let me pull it up as a quote. Heller's coming there. He wants to be a writer. He, he, he's this New York Jewish kid from who wanted to, who wanted to be a writer. And he joined and he kind of joined the the Air Force as a thought that he would get material to write a novel. Uh, anyway. A week before he arrived, Heller had written in his diary that he was ready to see action. He wanted to see, quote, skies full of black and fighters screaming past in life and death duels high in the clouds. That's what he expected to get to, to, to have happen. To me, as somebody, who, as somebody who's A, a writer, and B, had been in the service, and C, had been in a war that was not what I expected it to be, I got the idea that, it, that he, you know, that he had come there thinking the war was going to be what what it turned out not to be to him. It was going to be something grand and dangerous, and and something you know that was, people would go home feeling worthwhile about. And he discovered that you know he's, he's you know knocking down Italian villages, and um, you know and it's not what he wanted. Um, and that then he takes what he thought was the coward's way out of of of, of being nice to the people who who enjoy. And getting this and getting this gig, as uh, you know, as, as an actor in this documentary. And the documentary, the the, the guy Wilbur Bloom, the guy who's who's making the documentary in his diary calls it a boondoggle, a boondoggle for the colonel. So for for those of my listeners who are on this side of the pond, what do they mean by boondoggle? Uh, you know, uh, you know. Baloney, uh, yeah, you know, you know, a, you know, a cock up. <laughs> so it's it's interesting that the other guys that you you spoke to there, all would have been quite happy to, to take the gig to get away from these from these operations because they're flying into thick concentrations of flak. So they might not be the glorified fighters that Heller was thinking, but even at this stage, these are not operations that. Or walk in the park. So Heller taking right. this option that that he regretted was one that probably anyone else would have taken had they had the chance. Right, right. I never t I never ran across a guy who said who, who thought badly of him for doing that. But Heller himself, uh, Buck Henry, who wrote the screenplay for the for the movie, mm. I talked to him extensively about uh, about it, and he had and he'd had a lot of dealings with Heller while there. And he said, Joe Heller was the angriest guy I ever met in my entire life. And that's a person who's pissed off at themselves. And it, and it makes it, but, but so there's an old joke in Hollywood that directors are, in so in, are so in love with themselves that they want to run the world. Actors hate themselves so much they want to be somebody else. And writers are so pissed off they want to create an alternative universe. And it's true because as, as a writer, I can create a world where things work the way I want them to. So it's and interesting that, what, that that Heller creates this this sort of nightmare world that no matter what he does, he can't get out of it. So maybe right. that that's but his, but but his character does the honorable thing. Mm -hmm. Yossarian is Yossarian is Heller, and through that, he's able to well as buck henry said didn't really work out work out his feelings yeah. on it but he he's trying to maybe he says to himself that even his bad and, and also heller was all henry said that heller was all was always slightly pissed off about the book the interesting thing is cash 22 is the only book heller's known for but it's not the only book he ever wrote no. it's the only book that was really successful and the other books were his attempts to write 
serious literature. And I look, I, I, I look at, the, at, some, at some of the stuff that you, you, may, you might find if you looked in the IMDb for, for, the, for the movies I got credited for. And I'll, t and I'll tell you, yeah, that's the stuff I got paid to do. But the stuff I really wanted to do, it's sold that it never got made, which is true. It <laughs> happened that way. And I, and I sort of looked down on, the, on, on, a lot, on a lot of the things that I did at that point. Um, which is one reason why I think I changed over to being a supervising producer on a, in television. But it, you didn't have to fight so hard about movies. Mm -hmm. But anyway, though, um, the write, a writer has their own family. You know, this is my quality work. This is the shit work I get paid for. Um, and, and Heller always kind of felt that Cast 22 wasn't his best work, but it's the work that made him a millionaire. And you know, and so so he was he was a conflicted guy, because he 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 returned to it much later, didn't he? And and closing times was a strange, a strange book, because um, uh -huh. it's almost it's that sort of trying to reconcile things many many years later over what had happened. And I, I've I've always struck, it, it took, struck it took him it took him ten years to write the book. He, he wrote draft after draft. Draft after draft, and, and also it's a very funny. This is this is a funny little bit about, about the book. Do uh, you think Catch Eighteen would have would have the same resonance to people as Catch Twenty Two? Unlikely. I would guess what? The original title of the book was Catch Eighteen, except that in 1962, when it's getting published, two months before before they go they're they're going to the to the print shop. Um, he gets a call from his from his publisher and telling him that Leon Uris is right is publishing Mila eighteen. Your Leon Uris was at that time a you know super best selling um, author of what we call beach movie beach books here. Um, and he and he'd written Exodus and he was following it up with Mila eighteen. Um, and so they went, we can't use 18. If people all mistake it for, for Eurus's book. So what do you, what do you suggest? And Heller's, uh, according to the story, Buck Henry told me that, that Heller told him, he sits there on the phone thinking, oh, what do I do? And he goes, well, how about 22? <laughs> and that's how Catch 22 <laughs> became Catch 22. It, it, it's funny how these things work out for something that's become such a part of the lexicon of yeah. everyday life is it, it, that it's, it's a term that everybody in the world knows. You can go to any country and say that's a catch twenty two, and everybody knows exactly what you mean. It's funny how those things work out. But anyways, let's we, we've talked we've talked about Joe Heller for quite a bit. Your book is a lot bigger than than just oh yeah the, Joe's the, Joe's experience. Let let's talk about the fifty seventh for a few few minutes because fifty seventh is, is a yeah. The interesting thing about the 57th is that they're virtually unknown today. What they did won the war in Italy and is the most successful battlefield bombing campaign the U.S. Air Force ever engaged in. Ever. You have to understand, the, 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 the war in Italy was everybody's best second, second choice. The Allies took North Africa, they took Sicily, they had reopened the, the, the Mediterranean sea lanes, and the Americans didn't want to do anything more. They wanted to go get everybody ready to go invade Normandy. But that was going to be a year from, from then. And Churchill, who was trying to get any place, but he, he, the last thing he wanted to do was go to the Western Front again. And yeah, you can understand that. Um, so he kept saying, well, we can go to Italy and we can knock them out. And we can go through the Ljubljana Gap and we can end up in, on, on the Hungarian plane and we can take Eastern Europe before Stalin does, which is an interesting idea. They could have. Um, but, and he finally said to him, we can't let the Germans sit there for a year and just get better without us doing something. We have to fight and we need to fight. So they ended up going, okay, well, we need to have a fight. We'll have a fight in Italy. And the end result was that they didn't have their best commanders there. So they go down and... The inter uh, another is that Hitler didn't at first think that the Germans should fight in Italy either, and Rommel had him convinced that if they were going to do it, that they should just leave so leave southern Italy. They should 
move the troops and put in and, and, and take them up to a line in the Apennines in northern Italy where they could seal it off and keep the Allies from getting into, into Austria and, and, they'll, and also that Ljubljana gap. And, that was, and that's what became the Gothic line. Originally, they called it the, the Hitler line, and then they went, wait a minute, what if, they, what if they, the Allies defeat us? Uh, Hitler won't like having the Hitler line being, being breached, so they changed the name. But, a, 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 bit um, of, a bit of sycophancy that d doesn't quite work out and a quick backtrack on it. Right. But the only guy who wanted to fight in the rest of it was, was Kesselring, who was the air commander. He's the Luftwaffe field marshal. But he's the, he's the theater commander. And he said, if you let me fight in, in southern Italy, I'll make them pay for every inch they take in blood, and it will take a year for them to get to Rome. And Hitler said yes. And that's what happened. You have all the fight, the, the landings at Salerno and the fighting. And, 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 they, and then they get stuck at Casino. They were stuck at Casino for five months. They ended up bombing the, bo the monastery, which didn't, didn't have any troops in it until it became wreckage, and then it was great for the troops, and, and the Germans showed up then. Um, but they finally, they, you know, they invade in, in September of 43. Finally, in June of 44, they get their breakthrough at, at, at Casino, and they get it all set up for the army that landed at Anzio is going to move is, is going to move east, and the Fifth Army at Casino is going to move north, and they're going to meet, and they're going to close off, and they're going to capture the German 10th and 14th Armies, and they're going to, and the war will be over. Well, that was all set up, and then General Mark Clark, who was an idiot, he's, he's one of the great American idiots of, of military history, um, he said, he, he's fixated on becoming the liberator of Rome. And he diverts the Fifth Army to Rome. And while he's parading to the streets of Rome, the Tenth Army is marching around Rome, and the 14th on, on the east, and the 14th Army is marching around Rome on the west, and they meet up north of Rome, and they head on up, and they get to the, and, and they get to the Apennines by September, and they settle into this really nice, heavily fortified line that Rommel had set up, the Gothic line. And the Allies, and, and, and by this time, they have the, the invasion of southern France. And so the best units that are in Italy, in Italy are, have been removed to become, part, to, to become part of the invasion force for, for France, the, uh, for, for Normandy. And then the other ones are, are used in southern France. And 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 what's left in the uh, of the army in both British and American and, and are um, not first rate troops, just put it that way. And they and they they fight their hearts out in Operation Olive in September and October, but they can't break through. Yeah. And then the rains come, and you got the winter of forty four forty five, which is the coldest winter in Europe in over a century. And that, that's why the Battle of the Bulge was the way it was. That's why. The last six months of World War II were just terrible in Europe because of the weather. But they had, but they have nothing left. How are they going to? How are they going to break the Germans? Well, the Germans are their main. Their main center is Bologna, in the Po Valley, and they're getting. And there's a railroad that comes from from Munich down through the Brenner Pass. It's an eight-hour trip by train from Munich to Bologna, and they're and they're delivering supplies. They are delivering 300,000 tons of supplies a month to the German to the German army there, and they and they're getting all the all the supplies, and it's and the Allies find the, the one place that they have to go, the one place that they can attack the Germans after the failure of the of the of the ground assault, is to go after the railroad, and so the the 57 bomb wing sets up and, and says you know. Stuff them comes up with the, with what becomes Operation Bingo, and they start, they fly the first mission in um, on November sixth, and they went after the the electric transformers because at that point the trains that are being used are electrified, so if they destroy the transformers, then the Germans have to change to, to coal fired trains, which are the ones which they have to take from what they got in Germany, and it stretches their supplies even thinner. 
So they so they do that, and then they proceed to start knocking out bridges. And the Germans are rebuilding the bridges, and they're knocking them out again. And and the Germans are bringing in more and more flak. By by January, there are 450 88 millimeter flak guns in the in the Brenner Pass. And uh, you know the Brenner Pass, it's narrow. You got the you got the Alps to either side. These guys are coming in, and they and they have to come in because of the mountains at, you know, they're, they're going to come the same direction every day. And they're coming in at eight or nine, 10,000 feet because they don't have oxygen. And they also have to make certain that they're, that they're hitting bridges, which are hard to bomb. The Germans are putting the guns. Just, just to say at, that the, the pass is. Up at, up at, up at 6,000 feet in the mountains, mm. practically firing straight at them. I mean, think of the attack on the Death Star in the first Star Wars movie. And that's what bombing the Brenner Pass was like. Yeah, because that, that's, that's the thing. They may be flying at 8,000 feet above sea level, but the pass is, you know, four or 5,000 feet up and, as and, well. And, so and, it's, the guns, mm. and the guns are at six and 7,000 feet. Yeah, on the mountainsides, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you go, if, if you take the train nowadays, if you when you get to Rovereto, which is the worst place, um, you can look up, and you can see if you know where to look, you can see the concrete gun positions that are still there, and the, they couldn't take them down. It's so high up in the mountains. It, it's it always amazes me that you know there's there's these traditional passes because it's you know this is one of the great entries into Italy, isn't it? Everybody's marched through the Brenner Pass. And here we right. have in in 1944 we have wave after wave of B25 flying up it with the Germans trying it's to the flood down it. Yeah, yeah. And and the thing is that between between November 6, 44, and um, and April 5th, 45, which is the day they flew the final mission, the German the the, the trip but by by that time the trip takes. Four to five days from Munich to to Bologna, and three or four train changes because they have to change, take the stuff off of one train, and put it on the other train to drive over that part of the railroad that isn't destroyed. Uh, and the Germans are getting instead of three hundred thousand tons of supplies a month, they're getting thirty thousand tons of supplies every month. And finally, on April on April fifteenth, the the Allied Spring Offensive begins, headed towards Bologna. And on April 20th, five days later, the commander of the, of the German army initiates peace negotiations. And the Germans surrender in Italy on May 2nd, a week before the surrender in, in, in Germany. And uh, it was those guys and those bombers. Which is remarkable because that that figure of three hundred tons that that was far more than they actually required, wasn't it? So they've gone from a massive surplus to yeah. pover poverty yeah. in, in the space of two and a bit three months. Yeah. Mm. So these guys basically won the war in Italy, them and the fighter bombers, and uh, the Air Force didn't like having it there because it was they'd done a good thing for the army, which is illegal in the U.S. Air Force. <laughs> And they and they and they and they never and so it was never particularly publicized, and the war in Italy, the that that final year that that got added on by Mark Clark, is a year that's you know basically forgotten mm -hmm. in history because you know it but but finally in December of for, uh, forty four they finally get a good command. Lucian Truscott Jr. Um, is taken from the Sixth Army in 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 France and sent back to Italy and. Um, among guys who, um, among guys I, I interviewed, they said the air changed when when Truscott arrived, and that was why the army, by the time by the time the, the fighting came, they were ready to fight and they and they could, but he was the one that, that kept pushing, even when when people are going like the, the the losses are too bad over the over the past, and they were they, they were taking minimum seven eight percent losses over the, over the and and. There was, there was no airplane in the group that didn't get hit by flak at one time or another. And, and that's the sort of other main character in, in your book and, of course, in, in Catch-22 is the, the B-25, which I have always gone out on a limb and saying is, I think, North Americans' 
the best aircraft of the Second World War because it's a bit of a Swiss Army knife. It operates everywhere. And for, yeah. a, for a war, the accuracy is a very loose term. The B-25 was a very accurate bomber, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah, the, the, the whole thing, medium bomber in the U.S. Air Force doesn't, it isn't, a, it's funny, heavy bomber is heavy weight, and light bomber is light attack, but medium bomber actually applies to medium altitude attack. When they went in over 10,000 feet, they were putting up with uh, hypoxia because they'd taken the oxygen systems out of the airplanes because when the flak hit, the oxygen caught fire. And the interesting thing is, when they were flying in the winter, they were flying and they were wearing three or four sets of socks over heavy and then heavy boots. Um, they were wearing their they were wearing long johns, their uniforms, an electric heated flying suit, and then a big fleece line flying suit. And that's pretty that makes you pretty big. And the and a B twenty five is actually pretty small. If you sit in the cockpit of B twenty five, it's about as tight as an old Volkswagen. Hmm. I yeah, mean, and, I mean, I I have trouble climbing around in in, in the in the B twenty five that's here in t shirts and jeans, and the and and these guys were climbing around in you know in winter clothing. It, it, you know, it was just it was just tough to move inside the airplane. That tunnel from the from the bombardier station up into the the, the cockpit itself that is really small, isn't it? And if you're doing that, yeah, and all they, those and layers, they were, is... and they were and they were doing that, mm. yeah, that. That's space. I don't know how anybody ever got out of there in an emergency, but it did. Yeah. And um, just just on that, because one of the things that I, I I thought you covered really really well in the book is this the very unique situation of Italy on the ground. Because if because even after Italy surrendered, if you were hit and bailed out, you didn't just have to worry about the Germans, did you? Because there were so many factions on the ground in Italy. Yeah. Trying trying to evade was was nigh on impossible because you didn't know who you were talking to. Yeah, but well, well, the part if you, if you got out to, if you were outside the city, you managed you had a good chance of running across the partisans, and there were a lot of and there were a lot of guys that did that did, but um, yeah, there was there was a you know there was a civil war going on in Italy in the middle of the war between. You know, between the Italian left and the Italian fascists with the Germans, and the one of the things that that the Americans was almost every Italian they ran across had a relative in America, so they were very pro-American. <laughs> so everybody has a cousin who knows somebody. So as, yeah. as long as, long yeah. as you have that, yeah. Um, the other thing that I'm sort of jump, jumping through our questions here, just so we can, can keep chatting for a bit, is um. Yeah. What one of my aims on on this show is to to spend a good amount of time talking to to aircraft maintainers and and the mechanics because keeping these B twenty fives flying was frankly incredible because if the route to get to Corsica the USS Corsica as you cover in your book is down to South America and then across the South Atlantic all the way across most of Africa and up so they've done quite a lot of flying hours by the time they arrive but then yeah, twelve. Wow. Yeah, r r amazing. And then you've got some of these aircraft that you list in your book. You got some of the old B twenty five Ds are doing sort of one hundred and twenty five, hundred and fifty missions. Those those guys in terrible conditions with just tents and things yeah. did an incredible job. Yeah, and, and the the, the mechanic, um, when Joaquin Helbig bombed Jusanachia Airfield, which is where the three fortieth was, mm -hmm. and they lost their entire. Well, almost their entire fleet of bombers for the third time in 12 months. They, they during training in '42, they had lost all 18 of their bombers to a thunderstorm in South Carolina, and then, and then in in March of '44, they were at at an airfield just north of of Vesuvius, and they got and, and they got covered with with ash, and the pla and the planes were destroyed by by Vesuvius. In fact. Vesuvius destroyed more Allied aircraft than the German Air Force did. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's true. And then and then they moved to to Corsica in late in late April, and in mid May, they lose the, all their brand new airplanes. As one guy said, you know, it was very easy for the Germans 
to find the target because the flames reflected really brightly off all those nice silver airplanes. And uh, so, so the, the 340 is probably, if you look at photographs, you can see the airplanes that survived that. They all had, well, the airplanes from the group, from that group, when they get their replacements, they painted them. Yeah. Uh, they, they went up to the other allied airfields and they got as much, you know, green and brown and whatever paint. And they, and they put it over the upper surfaces of the airplanes in the immediate aftermath of the raid. And um, it was, it was, there was no primer. It was just put, it was put on the mops and brushes. But, um, but the interesting thing was that um, because of that, when the airplanes were being taken care of at night, when they were, because all of the, all of the maintenance was done outside, there were no hangars. They had to, if it was a silver airplane, a replacement or, or from one of those, those guys had to then get up on, on step ladders and throw camouflage netting over the airplane. And I've got a, I've, and there, there's an account by one of the, by one of the ground crew, crew chiefs that, you know, it was a terrible job and it, and it meant they didn't get dinner. And the, and the guys that had the camouflage airplanes didn't have to do that. You'd think after being on Corsica for as long as they were, they would have had better facilities, but it, it seems like they didn't think they'd be there long enough to need them. So they just got right. on with it. Mm. Right. And then they, fi they finally, in April, they get, get sent to the mainland and they end up at a pre-war Italian airfield with great big hangars and steam heated barracks. And they thought they'd lie, land in heaven. <laughs> it's such a strange existence for these, these crews that, I suppose fed straight into into Heller's experience that became what you're sorry and relates to us in the book. Yeah, to me the the most interesting guy of the bunch, the most interesting guy I met was um, he was the son of a socialist labor organizer here 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 in America, and he told me he found out that this this one officer who kept getting who kept showing up in the units he he was in throughout the was he found out after the war the guy was was a military intelligence officer who was following him because he might be a subversive. <laughs> Dan Bowling. Uh, but he, um, as Paul Young described him, he said he was the squadron leader, which is different from the squadron commander. And when he, when he arrived in, 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 at, the end of, uh, at the end of August, he had more B-25 hours than the guys who were flying missions. And he, and he also had an IFR green card. So uh, the guy who checked him out went and said, you know, you've got like 500 more hours in B-25 than I do, and I'm checking you out. Um, that immediately put him into, into leadership, aerial leadership position. And um, he ended up getting the best bombardier in the squadron, Joe Silnitz. And he came up with, the, they all were being told that they had to fly straight and level for like five minutes to get a, to get a good bombing pattern. Well, they also got a good flak pattern that way. And so he came, he and Joe went out and tested because they had to, you have to put the core, you have to put the coordinates in to the Norden bomb site on the ground before you take off. And they figured out how to set up the site so that they could fly the airplanes and maneuver and they would, you know, raise the altitude, lower the altitude, turn here, go to, and they didn't, and they, and they only came up on the final bomb run in the last 30 seconds. And they, and they were, and they were scoring as well as the, uh, as well as the guys who were, who were flying straight and level. And he had constant arguments with the, with the group commander over what he was doing. But he, as he said, he said, I, I nailed every target and I never lost a guy. That was what he was proud of. Which is, which is incredible to come out with, especially in, in that sort of environment. Yeah. But I, I suppose he that's. Was, he that... was that because the, the, the interesting thing was when I met him, which was six months before he died, he had been deep in Alzheimer's. But on the four times that I was down at his house, he, li he lived down in Palos Verdes. And the four times I was down in his house, the squadron leader was back. And, so it was, uh, it was something he was able to, to cling to and, and, and focus on. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's said that with, with all time, the most important memories are the last ones you, lo you lose. Yeah. But, um, but he was, God, what a guy. Uh, he, as he, as he, he ended up coming back and he, and he married his, 
married his sweetheart and, and they and he went into business with his father-in-law in the construction business. And they ended up building about half of Torrance, California, and a good and a good two-thirds of the houses on the Palos Verdes Peninsula. And as as he put it, I spent the I spent a year of my life knocking down people's houses and the rest of my life building people's houses. That's fantastic. But uh, when he died, I was asked to come down and speak for him. And he was, and the service was held in a church that he had built for his community. And it was full. There was about seven or 800 people there for that church. It wasn't a big church. So it was pretty full. And, after, and afterwards, four different people who were there together came up. And each of them told me four different stories where they had been with Dan where he had literally given the coat off his back to a man who had none. Wow. Yeah, he was like, he, uh, to, me, to me, he's like probably one of the five or six best of it. I mean, that, that generally, they're all great, but there are some of them that are just, you know, you go, wow, I'm really glad I, I ever knew that person. He's very high on that list. I think, Tom, that's a great place to, to start wrapping this up. Your book, okay. the, the Bridge Busters, is finally out here in the UK. So we'll we'll put all the links for people to to get it because yeah, we, we've we've chatted a lot, but that's barely scratching scratching the surface. And yeah, also it's, it's very funny that the book is published by who is published by um, here in here in America. That publisher is a long term right wing publisher. A pri they, they primarily publish published in politics and and they had decided that they would do some World War II books. And as as the editor said to me when I was put in prison, he, he was telling me about it and I said, you know, by the way, you ought, you ought to know that uh, you and I have nothing in common. <laughs> <laughs> and and he said, and he and there was a long silence and he says, well, World War II, the, you know, the, the, there's no arguments needed with World War II anymore. I didn't tell him that there was many arguments with World War II. But, but, so I ended up with, with them. And the funny thing, I mean, this, this you'll, you'll really get, everybody there will get a laugh out. They did, they did a really thorough public publicity campaign. I did, I did um, several weeks of, of radio interviews with, um, with, their, with their various networks here in the, in the state. And the best interviewer, I had the guy had re had read the book more than once. He loved the book. He was quoting pieces of the book. You know who that was? Who is that? It was Steve Bannon. <laughs> a, month before, a month before he became Steve Bannon. Oh my goodness! Yeah, L ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening and, and are worried about that, the book's nothing like that steve might have liked it but so did i and i i don't share anything with steve <laughs> oh, yeah everybody's liked it that's really good but yeah it, it, it i it's, it's my favorite funny story to tell people over here that's fantastic well it's not aviation related but tom i'm gonna have to have you back so we can talk about roger corman because i have so many questions oh yeah hey <laughs> we can do that for sure right well thank you so much for this and uh, like i said we'll we'll make sure that i brought his biggest hit Oh, nice. Sure, it was then. We're, we're just, we're just teasing people now. But yeah, you can, yeah, actually, if you want to see the terror within, you can find it on YouTube. Oh, fab, great, super, Tom. Thank you so much. Okay, I can't thank Tom enough for joining us here on the Damcasters. I thoroughly enjoy the Bridge Busters. As you can imagine, it could have been written for me. It's a fantastic companion to Catch Twenty Two but also expands out and shows you so many more incredible characters that Joe Heller flew with. Now, the book is available today, if you're listening to this on the day of release, so it's available from all good and evil bookstores. Of course, you can guess it from the link below here in the UK from our very own bookshop. A little bit of each purchase goes to supporting independent bookshops, and an even littler bit comes to supporting the podcast. Of course, there's other ways you can support us as well, as simple as telling your friends and leaving us a review on your podcast app of choice. The stars are what matters, but everybody's been leaving some really, really touching reviews as well. Thank you for those. I will intend to keep it going. 
times are hard. So I'm just going to gloss this one. There's a Patreon page, three quid a month plus a bit of that. If you want to join us on there, you get these episodes early. I'm doing slightly different intros and outros for those ones. That's entirely up to you. If you can, great. But the best way, tell your friends, leave some stars, and it's all happy days. Next week, we've got hurricanes. Lots and lots of hurricanes. I'm super excited. And you'll probably hear it in my voice. I'll be a little bit giddy. But there we are. Until next time, thank you so much for listening. And as always, please do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone. And it is a Boney Abroad's podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.